For the latest news and updates on Tibet, subscribe to Yalun YouTube channel. And don't forget to click the notification bell icon. How's this? We got you now. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, I'm always incredibly moved at these hearings because it's... Uh, it, it, Congressman Nunn, we haven't met before, but I'm astonished by the power and the profundity and intelligence of uh, your discussion with us today and your experience. So thank you for being part of us. Thank you, Chairman Smith, as always. Senator Merkley, thank you so much for your continued support for these important things. Um, Representative Steele, who spoke, thank you very much. And uh, Under Secretary Ezra Zaya, thank you so much for, for speaking here today. Um, I'm here, uh, my motivation is clear for the Tibetan people, for the Tibetan brothers and sisters that I've known for 45 years. It was 45 years ago that I wandered into a refugee camp in Nepal and was astonished by these extraordinary people. And um, the little that I've been able to help them in the meantime, I think has only to a very small degree repaid what they have given me over the last 45 years. So I'd like to acknowledge our Tibetan brothers and sisters in the room right now. Thank you so much. And then what the, this Tibetan community has been extraordinarily um, successful, as I've seen them all over the world, obviously in India, Nepal, Bhutan, um, other places in Asia, but in Europe and in the U.S. and this wonderful, vibrant Tibetan community in the U.S., many of them citizens, uh, is an extraordinary addition to the American dream and experiment. And um, uh, I, th I think as we've seen... Um, the contribution they've given us is something unique. Um, the commitment to nonviolence, the commitment to wisdom and compassion is something that we sorely need. Um, uh, Chairman Smith, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, First Night, uh, a movie that I made that you referenced when I had very long black hair. <laughs> and I'm going to go back and look at that again myself to remember who I was. For decades, as we know, the Chinese Communist Party's ethnic policies have been largely predicated on containment, denial, destruction, and assimilation. Repression has been most severe in Tibet and in East Turkestan uh, with our Uyghur friends. It should be noted as well where the CCP policies have included the separation of families, the prohibition of language, the destruction of religious sites and institutions, the collection of DNA, and a pervasive surveillance system through which the denial of information of movement is implemented. I think we, we well know now that the surveillance budget in China exceeds their military budget. I obviously do not have to explain this threat uh, to the Tibetan people's very existence to this committee who likely knows decades of atrocities behind CCP's ethnic policies much better than I do and have spoken so eloquently about them today. Thank you. But briefly, in service of Beijing's long-standing agenda to sinicize Tibet and manage, in quotes, individual nationalities, the Chinese Communist Party's policies have been characterized by cruelty, collective violence, and extreme persecution. The saddest truth is that the CCP's process of assimilation and erasure is all too often concealed by Beijing's intricate and powerful propaganda machine. Within China's digital prison, just like all authoritarian regimes, the Chinese government targets the very core attributes that define the continuity of a people, specifically the family unit, religious expression, cultural tradition, language, and environment, land. Literally, this was a land grab, a land steal from the Chinese side. Identifiable mechanisms like arbitrary detention, forcible transfer, rape, torture, disappearance are all tools that have been well documented throughout the course of Beijing's assimilation practices. Xi Jinping's recent appointment of Pan Yue to the Central Committee is likely 
an indication of this aggressive assimilation that will not only continue but surely intensify. And if the Beijing chairman's recent visit to Moscow is any indicator of a new era, every one of China's 55 ethnic groups, including Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians, are right to be extremely afraid. It does not have to be this way. As you know, the Dalai Lama has offered in, in countless ways over many, many decades, since the 1950s, a pathway to resolution built on a dialogue process meant to identify a peaceful and stable resolution in Tibet, which grants Tibetans meaningful autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution. I just as a sidebar, when the talks broke down between the Chinese and the Tibetans, um, which I believe was 13 years ago, I think it was about then, 13 years ago, was the Tibetan side brought to the discussion the Chinese constitution and their, dis their suggestions for a compromise were based on the Chinese constitution itself. The Chinese walked out and refused to resume discussion. So it's clear where they were coming from. Um, it's obvious why a mutual agreement is crucial to Tibet survival and the avoiding of the eradication of the Tibetan people, but it might be much less clear to Beijing how this benefits them. There are three key elements of this benefit to them. First, it lends Beijing the legitimacy that it so desperately seeks in Tibet and which it's never had. Second, it enables Beijing to reset the relationship with India. And third, if successfully implemented, a reciprocal agreement in Tibet removes or perhaps lessens the international stigma associated with De Beijing's abysmal human rights record ranging from acts of genocide like those determined by the International Committee of Jurists in 1960 to present-day criticism of Beijing's long-standing brutality in Tibet and East Turkestan, which has only intensified after the 2008 Tibetan uprising, which has been followed by years of self-immolation sacrifices from the Tibetan people in protest of the Chinese government's violent rule. I'd like to ask the committee to remember Tsawang Norbu, a very popular Tibetan singer who self-immolated last year in Lhasa, demonstrating a peaceful agreement in Tibet, which includes the rights of a child, the right to mother tongue, the freedom of movement, and religious practice is a powerful step up for Beijing, sending the entire world the right signal that the Chinese government is genuinely capable of addressing discord through dialogue with reason and a peaceable human value rather than the demonstration of brute force and denial. Two steps must be taken to help this happen. First, we must be clear about the history that brought up us to the point of the People's Republic of China and Tibet. Second, the United States allies and the international community must speak with a unified voice for me, this is the most important thing. The U.S. Congress, the U.S. people have done extraordinary things, but we can only do so much alone. We have to engage our European like-minded partners in a voice, a unified voice against this Chinese oppression. Um, for the record, the Chinese Communist Party invaded Tibet without any provocation whatsoever. And actually, at the suggestion of Stalin, at the time, um, in 1949-1950, as the CCP consolidated control over the Tibetan minority nationality, which obviously wasn't a minority of Tibetans, it was all Tibetans. The Chinese had been thrown out of Tibet at that point. The CCP violated human rights standards and contravened its own policy, promises to respect Tibetan institutions, Tibetans' religion, and the Tibetan people's right to self-determination. Open uprising in 1959, March 10th, 1959, in the Dalai Lama's harrowing escape to India, where he and many additional Tibetans sought refuge, and thanks to the generosity of India, remained harbored, where the Tibetan community has become a vibrant and beloved thread in India's plur pluralistic uh, democracy. During the next two decades, the denial and destruction of Tibetan culture, religion, and language, arbitrary detentions and torture, is estimated by the Tibetan government in exile to have resulted in the deaths of 1.2 million Tibetans, one-fifth of the country's population. 
Many more Tibetans languished in prisons, labor camps. Many of them I knew personally. In fact, there was a, an extraordinary Lama, Rebur Rinpoche, who lived with me for the last several years of his life, who had spent 20 years in solitary confinement. Um, many more Tibetans languished in these prisons. Their stories go on and on. Um, historic buildings were destroyed, monastics, temples, 6,000 monasteries destroyed, literally thousands of ancient Buddhist texts critical to the legacy of Tibetan Buddhism and the broader Buddhist community were burned, looted, or lost in the zealotry of the Cultural Revolution. Tibetans were collectivized, leading to unprecedented famine, which was really unheard of before in the CCP, but this also happened to the Chinese people themselves, it should be noted. They sought to thoroughly erase identity or any resistance. Other than specific methodologies, first honed in Tibet, now refined and in well-documented practice with the Uyghurs against the Uyghurs in East Turkestan, not much has changed. But the pattern, however, gives reason for grave concern that it increasingly expands to match the definition of crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity. Despite being bound to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which they are signatories to, the ICCPR, the Child Rights Convention, and others, Beijing has never demonstrated the standards defined within them in any concrete terms, which makes a mockery of the very vocal claim that China is committed to human rights and the rule of law. Beijing's assault on Tibetan Buddhism has evolved since its invasion of Tibet and in recent years exponentially so under Chairman Xi's rule. CCP policy has transitioned from total destruction of Tibetan religious institutions, gatherings and practices to one of control, including eliminating core attributes of Tibetan Buddhism while co-opting Tibetan Buddhist rights to determine their own leaders. Tibetans who peacefully oppose this are often detained, routinely tortured, permanently injured, or even killed for the peaceful practice of their religion. Reinforcing that point, the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights expressed concern about, quote, reports of systematic and massive destruction of religious sites such as mosques, monasteries, shrines, and cemeteries, particularly in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region and the so-called Tibet Autonomous Region, unquote. However, we must draw a line when the Chinese state re require that Tibetan Buddhist monks receive communist state approval before reincarnating, a demand that's so grossly antithetical to Tibetan Buddhist precepts that it cannot be justified by flimsy, falsified historical claims by a communist government professing to be atheist. Completely ridiculous. The most visible demonstration of, Tibet, of Beijing's aggressive assertion of authority over selecting the next 15th Dalai Lama must be opposed, and we must not, and we must note as a cautionary tale the first aggression by Beijing during the selection of the 11th Panchen Lama, literally kidnapping the child, had been identified by the Panchen Lama when he was six years old, and then propped up by a state sponsored imposter into the Tibetan uh, reincarnation's empty seat. I remember this moment quite well. I think I was in Dharamsala when this happened. And there was a photograph of this boy, the last photograph that was taken that's been uh, circulating ever since. The child has not been seen. We don't know if he's alive. His parents, his whole entire family was also kidnapped. They have not been seen since. As we've learned from the Tibetan Action Institute's recent and very valuable research, up to one million Tibetan children are currently and systematically being alienated from the Tibetan language and culture in compulsory boarding schools. The Chinese government's educational policies separate children from their families, forcibly transferring the children into schools far from their parents. Children are taught in Mandarin, as the CCP is keenly aware that mother tongue is a primar primary mode of cultural transmission one of the most fundamental components of the continuity of a piece of people's identity from one generation to the next, affecting everything from access to the arts, literature, song, and religious texts. They also note it's one of the last impasses for the control of Tibet and of the Tibetan people. 
uprooting native language is particularly egregious in the case of Tibetan culture, considering the role of memorization and recitation plays in the rigorous monastic education system of Tibet. And the CCP's program to sever the transmission of Tibetan language and culture to Tibetan youth proves successful. If it does, it will significantly advance the PRC's agenda to contain and assimilate the entire people. In its concluding observations on the recent third periodic report of China, the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights expressed concerns of reports, quote, the large-scale campaign to eradicate Tibetan culture and language, as well as the general undermining of the linguistic identity of ethnic minorities by the assimilation policy of the state party, including the coercive residential boarding school system imposed on Tibetan children. Loden's going to be speaking much more about this, aren't you? You're going to hear more details about that. As we argue the risks and f freedom associated with apps like TikTok, the CCP's vicious aim at the future of Tibetan children should send the world a distress signal of the systematic and often secret ruthlessness under which Beijing operates. I hope the committee will also note the forcible population transfer of nomads in Tibet. Having thrived for millennia, herding and cultivating the vast and incredibly valuable and sensitive Tibetan plateau and acclaimed to acclimated to Tibet's unique climate. Nomads are proven stewards of the land. Really, no one knows that better than the Tibetans, and especially these nomads. The Chinese have no experience there. Their culture is deeply tied to the environment's demands through a profound belief system that honors landscapes and all living beings. However, the Chinese government systematically expelling nomads from ancestral lands through forced migration transfers them into concentrated sedentary dwellings Dispossessed of their way of life and ability to make a living, the result is tantamount to the ghettoization of Tibet. According to Chinese state media, at least 1.8 million nomads have been transferred into these sedentary houses under government policies. This estimate is likely extremely conservative. That in uh, 2013, Human Rights Watch reported that over 2 million Tibetans, two-thirds of the entire population of the TAR, <laughs> had been rehoused, in quotes, with hundreds of thousands of nomadic herders forced into, quote, new socialist villages. Tibetans are not compensated or guaranteed income or employment when resettled. To the contrary, they're often coerced or forced into work programs that a UN special rapporteur reported, reported may, quote, amount to contemporary forms of slavery including excessive surveillance, abusive living and working conditions, restriction of movement through internment, threats, physical and or sexual violence, and other inhumane or degrading a treatment, treatment, some instances may amount to enslavement as a crime against humanity, meriting a further independent analysis, unquote. CCP surveillance in Tibet is pervasive at all levels of society. Beijing's matrix of technology, which is heavily invested in and finely tuned, monitors the movements, phone calls, and Internet habits of every citizen. The most minor offenses can lead to imprisonment, torture, and even death. Information control, Internet blackouts, and invasive digital surveillance feeds a massive state of control in Tibet. As we've recently witnessed, the emergence of CCP police departments in the shadows of democratic cities throughout the world is astonishing. We know the surveillance extends far beyond Tibet's borders. Within China, Chinese tech firms have developed software to detect and track Tibetans and other, quote, ethnic minorities within the PRC. A report published by the Citizens Lab finds that China's policy in the Tibetan autonomous region has gathered between 920,000 to 1.2 million DNA samples in the Tibetan Autonomous Region over the last six years. These figures represent a quarter to a third of the total population of the TAR. Human Rights Watch also details Chinese authorities systematically collecting DNA from residents of the TAR, including blood from children as young as five years old without parental consent. Can I imagine this with your own children? 
with our own children, our grandchildren, unthinkable. It should remind us of the East German Stasi methods, which uh, horrified us all. Families were encouraged to spy, report on each other, often through coercive or financial incentives. I hope the committee will note the dangerous pattern of death due to torture that has been observed, including the recent deaths of 19-year-old monk Tenzin Nima and 51-year-old tour guide Kunchak Jimpa. In both cases, as with many others, an investigation into deaths in custody and the prosecution of those responsible to them for those deaths was never undertaken by the Chinese authorities. I'd also like to note for the record Jigme Gyatso, a monk at Lebrang Monastery who recorded and released a video detailing his torture at the hands of Chinese police. He was sentenced to five years in prison for that video released in extremely poor condition, and as a result of his crime, Jigme was blacklisted from receiving private medical care until his death last summer. The appropriation of land often coincides with the persecution of a people. China's annexation of Tibet, the land grab, and Beijing's plunder of Tibet's abundant natural resources have significant regional security implications as well. One of the most Illustrative examples is water. China is water poor. In contrast, the Tibetan Plateau is the source of the entire region's major rivers. At least 1.5 billion people rely on for food and economic development. The PRC has erected numerous massive damming projects and continues with extensive plans for water diversion. China's occupation of Tibet provides necessary resources to China while allowing Beijing to control the tap for South and Southeast Asia. This is a very, very important factor. This is security for the entire world that we're playing with here. Precious metals and, and minerals serve as another example. Tibet's occupation provides access to 126 different minerals, including copper, iron, uranium, zinc, gold, and lead. Tibet has also large amounts of lithium, and that's critical to powering modern technologies like cell phones, hybrid and electric cars. Tibet's location and scale also provide a commanding position for the entire Himalayan region, a fact certainly not lost on the Communist Party. We've witnessed deadly skirmishes between the Chinese and the Indians in Arunachal Pradesh, where the People's Liberation Army encroaches on Indian borders and continues to antagonize stability in the region. Resource exploitation, environmental appropriation of the plateau overlay, a thick blanket of repression over Tibetans who call it home. Voicing or communicating concern over these policies puts Tibetan lives at risk of detainment, disappearance, or worse. And so fear permeates the plateau, leaving Tibetans silenced. This is how Tibetan people survive in occupied Tibet in fear and silence. According to international law, people deserve the right to determine their own future. The Tibetan people's call for dialogue with the People's Republic of China is an urgent cry for self-determination to protect Tibet's unique culture, religion, linguistic, and environmental heritage. This cry has been going on now for decades. While self-determination does not carry a single definition, the Tibetan people have proposed a way forward toward self-determination and meaningful autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution in a reciprocal proposal of compromise based on protecting the core interests of both Tibet and China. It's only as the Dalai Lama has presented multiple documents over these many decades that provide a concrete framework for negotiation, yet in contrast, Beijing refuses to return to the tables. Thirteen years have passed since the last Sino-Tibetan dialogue, although the U.S. Return, return, routinely calls for the resumption of dialogue. In fact, it's by law of the land now that it has to be called for. The Tibet Policy Act of 2002 requires that, a resumption of dialogue, and has made multiple laws stating support for dialogue. The CCP ignores it, and any like-minded nations calling for that same dialogue. Such a strategy must be called out. China must return to the negotiating table at the highest level immediately. And these are the policy recommendations going forward. To pass H.R. 533S, 
138, which has been discussed. Very, very important piece of legislation. And work with the administration to clarify U.S. support of the Tibetan people and negotiations with the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan leadership. This is essential, completely essential to long-term support of Tibetans' call for self-determination. Number two, the implementation of the Tibetan Policy and Support Act and the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act. These were really important things that passed congressmen over the last years, uh, both houses. Um, and, and we have to make sure that they are implemented and have followed through from, from all of us to go to the State Department, State Department and say, what have you done? We need the report. By law, this is something you have to do. And they need that encouragement. Follow the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights uh, in its concluding observations. They call on Chinese authorities to immediately abolish the colonial boarding school system imposed on Tibetan children, allow private Tibetan schools to be established, and ensure Tibetan is the language of instruction in Tibet. Also include and utilize the U.S. vote in the UN and optimize like-minded to press, of countries we're talking about, to press central committee members to halt the expulsion of nomadic herders, rural, rural residents, and small-scale farmers from ancestral lands. Also publish a comprehensive report on CCP's propaganda efforts in China and in international forums to manipulate global perceptions of Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the, the Chinese version of history, is a complete fantasy. And the decades of that fantasy is not going to change the reality or the truth of it. It's very important for us as, as free-speaking peoples to tell the truth about the history, and the history is clear for anyone to see. Monitor CCP's digital transitional uh, transnational oppression, international police presence, and evaluate the rights uh, violations both in China and in other countries. And finally, implement concrete restrictions for technology transfer and U.S. company support for forced or coerced DNA and medical data collection. I really want to thank the committee and everyone here for this very long testimony. <laughs> Everyone here knows this already, but maybe someone else listening to this hearing or reading it will hear it for the first time. And just, uh, it's an overview that I think my partners to my left are going into more detail. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much.